Well, he's actually, I found him um, very candid and very likable. Did you find that there were some roadblocks there, or was he being pretty forthcoming? He was being very forthcoming, and I think, you know, over time, the only deal, uh, and I worked this out uh, over time with him and also with Peter Elkind, who was working on the book, who had known Elliot both at Princeton and also done some, some um, profiles of him, the only deal we worked out was that if we discovered anything that hadn't been publicly known before, we would share it with him so that he would have an opportunity to comment. But he did agree to sit down for four very long interviews, and I think uh, the results are there. Sometimes, and that's the interesting thing about film, uh, sometimes the content of what he says is not nearly as revealing as his face, as his face and yeah. the manner in which he says it. I agree. It. And so that's part of the... You know, in this case, something that film can do that uh, you can't do on the written word. And uh, you can see things pass on his face that, that are much more revealing than actually what he says, particularly when he's talking about his own scandal, his own personal situation. No, I was, I was, I was moved by him. Because, because the image that you, of course, use, he uses it, you use it, the idea of someone like Icarus flying too close to the sun, very apt, obviously, but he got carried away. People do. People in power get carried away with their power. And he... He was brought down by that. He was, and I think he was brought down by certain... Look, I think at the end of the day, we have to recognize that... Uh, I mean, somebody says, uh, Karen Finley at the end said, you know, we want our politicians to be like gods. We're living through them vicariously, and we're always disappointed when they, when they, uh, when they don't live up to that godlike um, billing. I mean, all of us have a lot of weird personal foibles. All of us have desires that we can't control. And Elliot Spitzer is not immune to that. Um, and at the same time, you know, he was full of hubris. He felt that there was a certain time this happened. You know, suddenly he starts seeing prostitutes at a time when he was flying about as high as he could possibly fly. On the other hand, he reminded me a little bit, and I'm curious to see if you agree with this, of Mike Ovitz in the sense that he was flying highest when he was the DA of the state of New York, not so much as the governor. Right. The governor and every, you know, Joe Bruno and everything else that he ran across seemed, he didn't seem to be in control of that situation. No, you know, politics was hard for him because politics is often the art of compromise and also politics is the art of personal relationships in many ways. I mean, he wanted to make it about issues, which in some ways we wish it all could be about because it is about issues. But when you get in front of people, particularly people who have a certain amount of power because you as governor don't have it all, you have to reckon with them, and you have to reckon with them personally, and sometimes you have to think about not whether they're right or wrong in the issue, but you have to think about their feelings. And things Some that, of those scenes in the, in the big boardrooms that you had, where did you get that material? I oh, think? there's great scenes where Elliot Spitzer at one point decided, he, you know, he, he, he pushed a budget through by doing some backroom deals with Joe Bruno, and ultimately he got a lot of flack for that. So he decided, okay, things are going to be like the debating societies that we had on my, my dad's uh, dinner table, and we're going to sit in these public <laughs> forums, and we're going to discuss and debate the issues in front of cameras and everybody else. Well, Joe Bruno, as I think I say in the movie, was the turd in Elliot's punch bowl. I mean, he decided that what he was going to do was kind of tweak the teacher at every opportunity. He was the guy who was, when the teacher's back was closed, he was throwing erasers and hitting him on the back of the <laughs> blazer. So that's what, Joe Bruno was having fun. And now what is, as Elliot Spitzer, what do you do with a guy who is just mocking everything you're trying to do on this kind of high-minded issues level? Um, now, do you think that he would have, you know, if barring his, his bad behavior, and, bar, and by the way, he would have gotten away, what you're such a, are you saying in the movie that he would have gotten away with his bad behavior, i.e. call girls and everything, if he had, if these other men that he had turned into arch enemies hadn't gone after him? We don't know still. I mean, there's a lot of mystery and intrigue, which we flick at in the film, that we don't know precisely how it worked out. We're fairly certain that his enemies conspired in some way or leaked information in some way to the federal investigators and the federal investigators themselves abused their power to uncover Elliot Spitzer. At the same time, we do know he was using prostitutes. Uh, not, you know... <laughs> well, you were arguing that an ordinary guy who, who behaved as he did would not be well, brought in, to the same... I don't have to argue it. There, there were, in the affidavit, the federal charging document, there are clients, one through ten, Clients 1 through 8 and Client 10, we have no idea who they are. But mysteriously, Client 9, we know an awful lot about. How did that happen? Um, 
So, uh, you know, it's possible that, you know, he could have gotten away with it and could have continued. At the same time, you know, I think that's where this becomes not a neat and tidy story. This is more of a Greek tragedy type story where the very, you know, that um, he had that tragic flaw. He was doing something that was inevitably going to lead to his destruction. And, uh, you know, Dudley Do-Right can't afford to do wrong like he was doing, or sooner or later he's going to be exposed. Thank you, Alex.